Welcome everyone to the Ontology Summit 2020. Today is 6th of May, 2020. And I'm very pleased to introduce Ernest Davis, professor at NYU, who has been working on knowledge representations for the last 40 years or so, which makes him a real veteran of this field. And um, he has recently written a book. Perhaps you could tell us about that, Ernie. Okay. Uh, the book is called, um, titled Rebooting AI, Building, um, Building a Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust. Uh, and uh, I wrote it with Gary Marcus, who is uh, a cognitive psychologist and an AI um, does both cognitive psychology and AI and is currently um, uh, running his own company, Robust uh, AI. Uh, and it came out uh, last uh, September. It's addressed to a general audience uh, and it describes, it takes a somewhat contrarian view of the current trends in AI and uh, discusses uh, what we should be doing instead. And uh, great, great. So <laughs> eager to hear your uh, insights into time and space. Okay, well, uh, should I start? Yes, go ahead. Um, all right, so I'm going to start by talking about time and then time permitting, no pun intended, uh, I'll move on to space. Um, I understand it's 30 minutes for me to present and then we're going to be discussing for 30 minutes, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, you can run a little over, and we definitely want to hear about space. Oh, okay. I'll do my best to get into space, to, to fit, fit in space and finish in time. All right. Uh, first of all, time. So, uh, the other day, I wanted to, I was curious to know who is older, Joe Biden or Mitch McConnell? Uh, so I went to Google, of course, and no sooner had I typed in how old is than Google, the clairvoyant, filled in, the, filled, filled in uh, who I was asking about, how old is Joe Biden, and gave me the, I presume, correct answer that he is 77 years old. Uh, and then I asked about Mitch McConnell, and I had gotten as far as the M, and Google, again, in its clairvoyance, guessed that I was asking about Mitch McConnell and Gay told me that uh, he is in fact 78 years old. So Mitch McConnell is slightly older than Joe Biden, if you had ever been wondering. However, if you just ask the question, who is older, Joe Biden or Mitch McConnell, then Google doesn't shine so well. It gives a bunch of links which contain um, both Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell uh, but uh, don't address their comparative ages. Uh, and you run into similar problems with other uh, questions in Google. If you ask Google who was on the Supreme Court in 1980, let's say, uh, then it gives you a featured link, Supreme Court in the 1980s, uh, which sounds promising, uh, but which in fact is about the changing political environment of the court in the 1980s, the paywalled article. I mean, maybe you could get the information from this article, probably not. Uh, and if you go down to the seventh or eighth uh, um, link, you actually come to a page which has the answer in it. But, you know, this is information which is easily, which, you know, Google has in a certain sense, but is unable to uh, use. And again, uh, if you ask, was Abraham Lincoln alive in 1802? It leads you to a page with the features, a, a Wikipedia page about the Lincoln family, uh, which includes um, one of his relatives who was in fact born in 1802. You can see that it's bold faced, uh, but it's missing the point. And it's, you know, again, though the information is perfectly available, uh, it can't answer the question. Uh, things go a little, things go wrong in a different way if you ask how many years since the Declaration of Independence was signed. So there e Google eagerly gives you the answer, 239 years. And I tried, this was from a couple of days ago. Uh, and if you think about it a minute, that's not quite right. And if you look at the fine print, you can see why it's not quite right because 
Uh, it's just reading this from a document which was posted on July 25th, 2015. Um, and then uh, if you go to Google Books and to Google Scholar, which you know, take the temporal data presumably fairly seriously, uh, Google Scholar makes mistakes reasonably often. So if you look up Turing's page, Turing has a, Turing has a page on Google Scholar. Uh, so the imitation game, it claims, was written in 2006. Well, that's actually excusable for reasons I won't go into. Um, the Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis was written both in 1952, which is right, and in 1990, which is wrong, and that's a lot less excusable. Uh, and the, 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 the situation with metadata in Google Books was actually a major scandal uh, among librarians and such who care about uh, care deeply about the correct dating of books when Google Books came out. All right, so this is, this is I, always, I always like to bash on Google. Uh, this is what's not going right in the premier uh, AI program of our time. Um, and so let's, let's we'll talk about temporal reasoning generally. Where is temporal, why is temporal reasoning important for AI? Where does it come up? And the answer is it comes up practically anywhere. Uh, in, in any domain where things change, you have to deal with time. And if you want to deal with time in a flexible and reliable way, it's better to deal with it systematically than a collection of ad hoc patches. Uh, so where does it come up? Well, in text and video understanding, certainly, in narrative, um, and in particular in medical records, uh, in medical record, in understanding medical records, it's very important to know what the sequence or even what the time relations of the various things that happened is. Uh, so this has to be done systematically and question answering, as I illustrated. Uh, in any kind of scientific or technological reading documents, understanding of those, um, time is, is almost always an issue. Um, and information retrieval, the, the, the problem of outdated information uh, came up in a small way uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the example of the number of years since the, since the Declaration of Independence, but it, it's a persistent in, a problem. Uh, I mean, we've all had the experience of, of of needing to know some feature of some program we were working on and 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 doing a Google search and uh, you know getting an answer which was five years out of date, ten years out of date, twenty years out of date. Um, so there, uh, temporal reasoning is a constant problem in prediction and planning, likewise. What's the state of the art in knowledge graphs? And this is generally speaking, it's a large generalization. And as far as I know, I'm not actually an expert on knowledge graphs. Uh, and there are two things to, two limitations that feet jump out at you if you start to look. One is that many of the relations uh, that are in fact time dependent, if one looks at a long enough scale of time, uh, are taken to be atemporal. So, for instance, the spatial extent of a country um, or the population of a country even uh, is marked as an atemporal fact, just an eternal truth, whereas it varies with time. Uh, and, uh, you know, some triple, some facts are time stamped, but when they are time stamped, it's often just a decoration, so called. Uh, with little or no semantics and, importantly, little or no support from whatever inference engine uh, is, being, um, is, is being used on the knowledge graph. So I want to address a number of issues, and I'll address them in increasing order of difficulty. So there are essentially three uh, issues that are well understood. One is the basic model of time. Uh, the second is the representation language, and the third is the technology for purely temporal reasoning. And then there are difficult issues. Uh, the collection of temporal information from text is difficult. Indexical in expressions 
uh, raise a wide range of particular difficulties and then domain inference um, is hard. Okay, so the basic model of time is pretty much the simplest and most reliable that we have in any aspect of knowledge representation. So in simple narrative, time is an ordered line, which for, all, for, all, for essentially all purposes can be taken as isomorphic to the real line, real numbers. Um, and for most purposes, all you need is comparison, addition, and subtraction. Sometimes you have to do multiplication. Uh, for counterfactuals and for planning, you need to reason about what will happen if you do this, what will happen if you do that, what would have happened if he had done this and that. And there, uh, you need branching time. You need the possibility that time could evolve in different directions depending on what choices people make. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, that's all. Uh, that that simple that reasonably simple model suffices for essentially all uh, temporal reasoning. Temporal representations there are many they are well understood they have good semantics uh, so there's you know the situation the earliest AI one was the situation calculus originally invented by McCarthy and Hayes and then developed to a fine level of polish by Ray Ryder and Hector Levesque and their colleagues. Uh, there was the interval calculus of James Allen. Uh, there was my teacher, Drew McDermott's temporal logic, which was, was my personal favorite and is most expressive, but never really took off. Uh, the inference problem is hard in that. Um, uh, various people, including um, Peter Muller, forgetting his first name. Um, uh, developed the event calculus, which describes time in terms of interactions of events and states and linear time. Uh, and then there are approaches which come, modal approaches, uh, which come out of the philosophical literature and have been applied very successfully um, to some extent in knowledge representation, but to a much greater extent in program verification. So there's modal temporal logic, which was originally developed by Arthur Pryor and was um, used for uh, program verification by Am Amir Pnueli. There's dynamic modal logic. Uh, and these, you know, the, all these systems have their differences. They, they make different things possible to represent or convenient to represent, but they're all very well understood. And, and um, uh, overall very uh, expressive and powerful. Um, and so what's, so taking them all together, uh, now vagueness is always a hard problem. It's an unsolved problem throughout knowledge representation. Uh, and uh, for when one's dealing with uh, temporal expressions in language, vagueness is the, the difficulties of dealing with vagueness are a serious limitation. But leaving that aside, leaving uh, other than the problem of vagueness, uh, I think it's safe to say that in any situation we can represent the purely temporal aspect. We know how to represent it, and we know how to characterize the purely temporal aspects of most reasoning, and even to implement it reasonably efficiently uh, for the kinds of reasoning that actually come up in practice. So what is the state of the art in uh, temporal reasoning technology? So there's, there's basic timeline reasoning, uh, and this rarely involves more than simple linear inequalities, and I mean simple. These, these are not the kinds of things for which one has to bring out high-powered uh, linear inequality solvers. Uh, very simple algorithms will do, uh, and the interval algebra. Um, uh, technologies have been developed for high-level planning of various kinds, and those are either explicitly or implicitly uh, temporal. Uh, there is a technology of temporal databases in the database world, 
um, a somewhat niche area is my impression, uh, but there are databases which uh, have which have system, systematic ways of labeling tuples with uh, temporal constraints and then uh, supporting temporal queries and doing temporal inferences. Uh, and then there is uh, often undervalued or under-recognized in the AI world, there is the large area of program verification, uh, which is, you know, in practical terms, in many ways, the most successful application of knowledge-based techniques and of symbolic reasoning. Uh, and the technology there is, in many ways, immensely powerful at this point. They, you know, 100,000 line operating systems can be verified. Uh, can't be verified, but you can do, you can, you can do bug checking uh, and find very subtle bugs. Uh, and those can deal with, with complex temporal relations like subtle side effect relations, conditional loops, asynchronous parallelism, um, whatever you want, practically, in terms of what comes up in software. Okay. Uh, a point about temporal, both temporal reasoning and spatial reasoning is that even in terms of human interactions, there is a extraordinarily wide range of scale, and this does have an impact on reasoning algorithms which are not always set up to deal with that. So for instance, if you're taking a six month trip, uh, and, you know, one thing you do is start the car, the ignition in the car, and that's perhaps a tenth of a second to turn the key, uh, or a fraction of a second. Uh, so that's a ratio between the trip as a whole and some of its sub-steps sub of uh, 1.5 times 10 to the eighth. And the same trip may rain, involve reading about distances which range from a, me, a millimeter or so to 10,000 kilometers for the whole trip. Uh, that's a ratio of 10 to the 10th. Uh, and so you need for both, um, for bo both in the temporal and in the spatial reasoning parts of what you're doing, you need to be able to accommodate uh, this wide range of scales, and not all algorithms do that well for representations, particularly in the spatial side. All right, now let's turn to the hard problems. The first hard problem uh, I want to talk about is the difficulties of extracting temporal information from text. So you have a sentence like, afraid of COVID-19, parents are postponing well child checkups, including shots, putting millions of children at risk of exposure to preventable deadly diseases. Okay, so there's a lot of important temporal relations here between real events and between hypothetical events, uh, but they're not very precise and they're difficult to characterize. Uh, and then secondly, uh, even when things are straightforward, you have a straightforward narrative, um, events are stated out of order very often in natural language, and one has to do inference to put them back into order. So you have a sentence like, Tony managed to pour the wine, though he had to take, the cork, take out the cork with a knife because he couldn't find the corkscrew. So those three events are in backward order, uh, if you want to come up with a knowledge representation of the narrative, then you have to put them in the correct order, uh, and that's, uh, that's often not easy. Uh, text tends to be full of indexical in expressions, um, as to say, expressions that uh, place, an ev uh, place an event relative to the current time or relative to some uh, reference time. So you have, and, and these are much more common than actual timestamps in text or in, in, in dialogue. Uh, so you have last week at two o'clock today, next Tuesday, and then you just have a tense system, past versus present versus future or relative to the current time. So in conversation or in the QA system, uh, these expressions almost always refer to the current moment and that one would think should be easy, though, as we saw, uh, Google QA can get tripped up on that. 
um, indexicals in uh, a text or recording generally refer to the time that it was written or utterance or published or something. Uh, but even there, there, but there, there are many exceptions. So, for instance, if somebody is quoted as saying yesterday, that means yesterday relative to the time he said it, and that can be significantly different. So, placing if you have a text with indexicals with describing events, and you want to place them in an absolute timeline, then you need to know the date of the text or the utterance, uh, and that can be trivial if the document is dated and extremely difficult if it is not. Uh, extracting temporal relations from video. There are other sources from this video. So to the extent the video, the video is simply recording straightforwardly in real time, then it's trivial. You know, the relative times are, are given by the time markers on the video. And if you know the absolute time of the start, then you have all the absolute times. But otherwise, uh, if you, let us say, are watching a film and you want to find the time relationship between two consecutive scenes, even if they are in order with no flashbacks or things like that, uh, you know, judging whether these two scenes are an hour apart, a day apart, a week apart, two years apart, um, is critical for understanding the narrative. And it's an extremely hard problem in general relative to the current state of AI. I don't know of anyone who's, I don't know of any work in the area. Um, and then, of course, and, and to do this kind of thing well, you need a lot of domain specific inferences. So, for the examples that I started with, we can infer that Mitch McConnell is older than Joe Biden, if we have the simple rule that order is equivalent to birth of X is less than birth of Y, uh, we can infer that Abraham Lincoln was not alive in 1802. Uh, if we have the simple rule that uh, a, a person is alive at times between their birth and their death. Um, so those are easy. Now, if you want to take the vaccination example or the wine pouring example and characterize the background knowledge, then you have a hard problem in uh, knowledge representation. Uh, there seem to be some questions. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, why is there a problem in temporal reasoning? I think I've addressed that. Um, Why do they not, why do the AI problems not normalize temporal expression shown by you into a standard of time? Um, well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that uh, one, of, one often has, uh, one's knowledge of relative time is often better than one's knowledge of absolute time. So translating everything into absolute time uh, throws away a lot of your information. Uh, and the other is, you know, uh, as, as I say, as I will say, that, you know, I think do, they, I think AI programs could do a lot more. So then, then they get to that takeaway. Um, the takeaway in terms of the time part of this talk is, first of all, that it's an extremely important problem. Secondly, that some aspects are straight, some aspects are straight forward, others like dating and undated document are essentially AI complete. Um, but I think the key point uh, that I want to push here is that uh, a lot more could be done. It could be pretty easily done with the existing technology than is currently being done. Now, one could not, I don't think, practically in terms of, in terms of inference, uh, make with a uh, Google knowledge graphs uh, completely consistent temporally. Uh, but you can do a lot with very short inference paths, either at query time or at fact addition time. One could, you know, if Google wanted to, uh, they could make questions like the ones I started with answerable a lot more reliably. Um, and they should. Um, uh, the problem of obsolete and outdated information in knowledge sources is a serious and a diff is a serious issue, which is only going to get more serious as time progresses and the amount of 
obsolete information on the web uh, increases. Uh, and uh, it's also a very difficult issue and, and people should be, should be, should be working on that. Um, and uh, in general, if, you're, if you are designing a knowledge graph, uh, I would argue that you should consider from the start what kind of temporal knowledge to include and how it can be used. Uh, and uh, the alternative, which is to ignore time and do everything in the timeless present, uh, is easy, but it may not be <coughs> wise, and may, you may end up with a uh, technical debt, which is hard to repay. Okay, so maybe I should uh, take a break here before moving on to space. Any comments, questions? I have the chat window up. Can't one address, uh, so Leah asks, can't one address uh, issues of outdated information in part by looking at the metadata for pages that the information is posted on? The example I showed had a timestamp for when the information is accurate for. Um, a, well, um, yes, to some extent. Um, I mean, that's, it, it's helpful. First of all, there isn't always the metadata. Uh, and second of all, uh, the metadata is the date that the information was posted. And what you have to know is, uh, you know, the sell by date. Uh, how long is the information going to be valid or what kind of new information um, overrides the old information? You know, if you, if you have the statement, uh, you know, an awful lot has changed in the world um, in the last two months. And there are many statements that uh, were true in January that are no longer true. Uh, and, um, you know, this was not anticipated, this could not be anticipated in November. Uh, and the question is, how do we now, how do we now take that into account? Uh, Ravi has a question too. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you showed many, many standards for time, defining time or calculating time mm -hmm. algorithms. Mm -hmm. Is there a preferred way uh, that people are using in various repositories? I know databases tend to always timestamp the data, but taking it from that raw format to a meaningful uh, search uh, in uh, text, you know, saying so-and-so is older than so-and-so or not, that, that kind of pathway, uh, is there a preferred time standard for it that would make time come at par with space? I know you will probably show us some difficulties in dealing with spatial reasoning as well. But assuming that time is more difficult, I'm asking this question. Uh, time, time, I think, is, 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 is easier in principle. Um, if, if I get to space, we'll see the difficulties in space. Uh, I don't know to what extent there is a standard. I imagine some of the people here know better. Um, is there, uh, uh, yeah, um, it's a good question, which I don't, uh, which I don't know. Really, I mean, uh, you showed a temporal set of representation. Yeah, those are, those, are, those, are, those, are, those are, those are for a variety of, uh, the, those are, um, uh, those, I mean, they're, 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 they're essentially two different, they're, first of all, they're two very different categories of temporal information uh, and temporal reasoning. One is, um, you know, a sort of historical uh, where you actually timestamp a individual event with, um, with the time it occurred or the interval over which it occurs uh, in absolute terms. Uh, and that's, uh, that's 
comparatively that that's uh, that's one uh, type of representation, uh, and the other is uh, relative representations. Uh, so you have uh, you have a say a narrative with no particular um, with no particular grounding in time, and you want to know the relative time of events. Or you're doing program analysis, you need to know uh, the order in which operations occurred or might occur, um, mm -hmm. but you don't need to know the you know the calendar date on which they are going to occur. So yeah, as you said, it just totally depends on what type of material you're looking at, and then and then you want to be able to combine them both because um, you know particularly in textual interpretation you get uh, you get both sorts of information and they have to be combined. And, and, you know, um, from the point of view of developing an inference engine, the combination is not difficult. From the point of view of developing a standard, for, I, I think there, is, there are several standards for temporal information. There was, there was, a, you know, there was a time ML uh, project which had a rich language of uh, temporal markers. Um, and yes, um, yes, that would be useful. Well, you can look that up. Um, so I mean, that, that probably had a that, you know, that probably had a sufficient language for most purposes. I don't know if I, how old time I am. I'm sure, there's an how old time on that. <laughs> I haven't looked at it. Uh, should I move on to space? Uh, um, wait, um, Nancy. Had a question, Nancy? Leah, Leah. Nancy, can I unmuted you? Nancy, you there? Um, yes. So I'm wondering how you're going to represent the time. You know, I'm thinking about knowledge bases being in a triple format or even RDB format. But so how how are you? You say you should consider time and represent it, but how? Uh, well, you can as, as you, you you can if you have um, event if you if as I say if you have if you have this historical events then they can be time stamped. Uh, you can you can you can you can do it with, either with an absolute time stamp or attach a time token uh, to a uh, to a triple and then uh, separately record temporal relationships between the uh, time tokens, right? So you can have, uh, say that if, if, you're, if, you, if you know that two events occurred an hour apart, but you don't know their absolute times, you don't know what day they occurred on, uh, then uh, you, you, as you, um, Say that one occurred at time 101 and the other occurred at time 102, uh, and then separately have a have a database which uh, has uh, the, the that records the relationships between those two. So you know, from a technical point of view, um, it, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's, it's difficult purely on the temporal side. How you know how best to integrate this into into the overall system is 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 probably involves a variety of problems. Actually, uh, Owl uses XML schema data types. Oh, and, okay. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that of all of the kind of elementary data types in XML schema, almost half deal with time. Really. It's really, time is very complicated. Time is complicated, <laughs> all right. Um, maybe it's, be, you know, human, human time. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, let's see, Leia still had some open questions. Is yeah, Leia's there? questions, as far as I've seen them, I don't know the answers. <laughs> she knows much better than I do, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, do you want to comment on that, Leah? I've unmuted you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, 
Okay. Oh, I was just kind of pondering those types of questions. Um, I thought your example was interesting. You know, it, it's showing, okay, it was 200 and, you know, how many years on this particular date that this document was created. And yeah, I can see the challenge of saying, okay, how is this system or how is this ontology going to address these mathematical, you know, calculations of, okay, if this was posted on this date, and it's saying this date and that today is this date, what, you know, what, how does that change that information? Um, but I would say for things that are a little bit more straightforward um, in some of your other examples you showed at the beginning of your talk, I definitely think, you know, looking at the type of material you're looking at and knowing, okay, this is more likely to be a little bit more ad hoc and how they're dating or controlling the uh, mechanism for showing dating um, you know, it's going to be one end event or something like much more structured, like, you know, a research database where that idea of time is very much regulated and saying, okay, this was a first, this was a preprint. This was the formal version. It was posted on this date. And then it was released in a print journal, this date. And like all of those dates are very seriously take, um, taken under um, consideration. So I guess depending mm -hmm. on the type of material you're looking at, how you handle that sort of issue is going to, to change a little bit. Oh, sure. Sure, absolutely. Okay, I think um, we should move on to space. Okay, well, to tell me when to stop here. Um, all right, so some more, I'll, I'll switch from Google bashing for a minute to Wolfram Alpha bashing. Uh, if you ask how far is the border of Mexico from San Diego to uh, Wolfram Alpha, uh, the type is a little small here, uh, but the answer is 1144 11, miles. Uh, and that's because Wolfram Alpha is ignoring border uh, and it's taking the distance from San Diego to the geographical center of Mexico. And in fact, it provides a handy dandy map uh, showing how it did the calculation. Uh, if you change it to this, this, I, this is really strange. If you change it to how far is the boundary of Mexico from San Diego, the answer is 2.947 million square miles. Uh, for some reason it thinks that I'm supposed to be multiplying the distance from New York to boundary, whatever that is, uh, by the distance from San Diego to the center of Mexico. Um, all right, enough bashing. Uh, the applications of spatial reasoning are more limited than those of uh, temporal reasoning in terms of AI. So certainly it's central in all kinds of scientific and technological um, applications. It's central in robotics and it's central in vision, uh, much rather less so in text, understand. You know, it's important, but not nearly as important as temporal reasoning. Um, and correspondingly has gotten less attention in the AI world. Uh, so again, I will outline the uh, issues, <coughs> pardon me, in increasing order of difficulty. So the basic model is well understood. Uh, and how you can represent geographic information, specifically in knowledge bases, uh, how you do spatial representations for, exa for exact information and calculations with that kind of exact information. Wherever you have exact spatial information, you are dealing with a well understood problem, um, not an easy problem. Uh, when you get into partial information and when you get into extracting spatial information from data, and again, of course, domain inference, general domain inference of any kind, you are dealing with very difficult problems. Uh, so space is, is three-dimensional Euclidean space that does, that's, that um, I would claim, and Michael I see is here, Michael Gruninger I see is here, might disagree, but as far as I've seen, this suffices for uh, most purposes, or practically all purposes. Uh, a point is, 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 is a point is usually defined in, in, by Euclid. Uh, a region is some kind of well-behaved set of points where well, what is meant by well-behaved is, 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 uh, is uh, 
need some technical work. Uh, and then other kinds of space, spatial entities like surfaces and directions and so on. There are other kinds of uh, uh, sets of points or functions over points and so on. So this is all stuff that's been done in the mathematical world for 100 years. Um, and how do you represent it? Uh, so for a point, you have a coordinate system and you represent coordinates. That's straightforward. There are different coordinate systems, of course. Uh, for regions, there are many uh, representations. There are point clouds and voxels and constructive solid geometry and mesh representations of surfaces and so on. Uh, and, and so on, and new applications often introduce new representational systems. So for instance, you know, the advent of 3D printing uh, required a whole new representational system um, centered around, you know, building up uh, physical stuff in layers. Uh, and which one you want to use depends on what features you need and what kind of computations you are going to be performing. Um, and if it's interacting with some kind of physical device, like a monitor or a camera or a, uh, or a 3D printer, then it depends on the characteristics of that device. Uh, and um, doing algorithms on these is challenging, but solvable. So there are many algorithms and there are large amounts of solvable. This is all of this where you have exact information. Um, this is all um, series. Uh, this is this is the this is this is all problems uh, that are difficult but have been solved, and which for their largely are uh, quite good solutions, though not necessarily. Uh, the problem of scales, which I came up before does tend to, uh, this large range of scales does tend to create havoc with many of these representations. Uh, many of these representations, um, most I should say of these representations, assume uh, that the range between uh, you know, the, the widest, the largest distance that you're considering and the smallest distance, the smallest precision that you need is not too, too large, otherwise they get into trouble. Um, now, if you, have an, if you have a knowledge base, what can you represent in terms of geographic, what, of geographic knowledge? If it's a geographic knowledge base, or what is represented? Well, various things. So, for instance, the location of the geographic center, uh, a bounding box, the extreme, the, the bounding box in terms of latitude and longitude, some area measures like area. Um, containment relations and bordering relations, uh, and a map, which is just usually stored in uh, image form. And this is sufficient for some, it's, you know, sufficient for many purposes. If you want to compute the flight distance between cities, then, you know, uh, cities can be taken as a point without much uh, trouble in terms of the distance between them, flight distances between them. Uh, and you have, you know, you can compute that from the latitude and longitude. Um, and then uh, Wolfram Alpha and other sophisticated systems record more information, but as we see, they're uneven in the degree to which they can use them. Uh, so, for instance, here is the geography for uh, the geography which is stored in the uh, Wikipedia info box for Florida. So first of all, there are co the coordinates. Again, there is a particular point, uh, and this is in fact the geographic center of Florida, which is a point sort of halfway up the main peninsula. Um, not in the case of Florida, a particularly useful or meaningful point, but you know, it does, if you do compare it to you know, the coordinates for the Ukraine, it does give you the right general direction and distance that you're talking about. Uh, and then various other features. Uh, the area, uh, the dimensions, just in terms of length and width. Uh, I mean, this again, this is a bounding box dimensions. Um, somewhat charmingly, it has the three-dimensional information. It has the lowest elevation and the and the highest elevation. So, if you think of 
uh, Florida as a three-dimensional, as, as a surface in three dimensions, then you have some amount of information about that. And then there's the bounding box in terms of latitude and longitude. Uh, and that's it. Uh, and then there's, of course, a number of maps. But those are in image form. Uh, now, um, so that's, those are the easy parts of the problem. Let's look at the hard parts of the problem. Uh, suppose we have a, um, a cheese grater like this. Uh, and uh, so, and we want to reason about the relationship between um, its geometric characteristics and its physical function for grating cheese. Uh, and other things to be graded. Uh, so it has features at a variety of scales. There is, first of all, overall this sort of truncated pyramid. Uh, there is the handle, which is smaller than there. there are these holes, which are smaller yet. And each of these holes has a lip, and there is a sharp blade at the lip. So you have a variety of um, features at different scales. There are topological features. So the holes go through the grater and they connect the outside of the grater where the cheese is to the cavity where the cheese falls. Uh, and then there's this systematic repeated pattern. Uh, and the point is that, I mean, one can, one can give an exact, it would be rather lengthy, description of uh, this grater, of this particular grater. Um, I don't know whether I'm not I'm not I'm not an expert on 3D printing. I don't know whether current 3D printing technology is is up to reproducing this grader, but I would imagine so. Um, reproduces more complicated objects, certainly. Uh, I don't know it would be usable given the materials either, um, but it would be complicated. And the point that I want to make is that one can reason about. Um, how to use cheese without having a fully detailed description of the of the grader uh, and think uh, so so a case reasoning with in terms of reasoning with generic information so you want to reason let us say that if you turn a coffee cup upside down the coffee will pour out uh, and certainly there are physics engines that can do that uh, it's not as easy as you might suppose and and some physics engines get it wrong but there are plenty of physics engines that can do it but they have to have the exact specification of, first of all, the shape of the cup, and second of all, the turning motion, and third of all, the amount of coffee in the cup. Um, and then they can do the prediction. But people can do the prediction without having this exact information. They can do it in generic terms. And so you would want AI systems to be able to do that. Uh, and you want to be able to use the inference in multiple directions. So if you see uh, um, you know, a couple of years back, there was a, a mini Twitter scandal about a uh, weatherman who came on his show and was toasting his uh, co-host with a cup of coffee and was holding the coffee upside down, the coffee cup upside down. So it, uh, um, it was clear that he was not actually drinking the coffee. Um, Uh, string bags are harder because they're flexible. They're not elastic. One has to keep both of those things in mind. So the overall shape is very variable. You can fold it up and put it in your pocket. Uh, and you want to be able to do reasoning like the peppers will stay in the bag, but pea, you can't use it to carry peas because they will fall through the holes, nor can you use it to carry very large objects which won't fit in the bag. Uh, and you want to be able to characterize this regular structure strings and knots without specifying every single string and every single knot. So again, even the representation problem here is, is hard and unsolved, uh, and the inference problem still more so. Now there is a literature on qualitative spatial representations and qualitative reasoning, but it seems to me, and I, 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 I followed that literature closely and contributed somewhat to it. Uh, but in general, I think it's fair to say that there's a large gap between the theory that exists and the technology that would be useful. So there are systematic representations and reasoning techniques for particular relations, part whole, topological relations, direction between points. But to a large extent, this is mathematics in search of applications. 
uh, and we don't really know how to represent qualitatively things like the cheese grater or the string bag, or we certainly don't have a reasoning mechanism for it. We don't even have any good benchmark sets on which to evaluate it. Um, extracting information from text. How am I doing for time? Uh, or how much more? I see I have my clock, but how much more time can I take on this? Can well, we would like to have a time for a few questions, so we need to wrap it up very quickly. I Maybe need to wrap minutes. it up very quickly. Three minutes. Other three okay. or four minutes? Sure. So natural language is notoriously terrible. Uh, video gives precise, incomplete information, not generic information. Um, and extracting about shapes or about situations, extracting spatial relations is understudied. So for instance, in this picture, any good vision system can recognize that this is a person and will uh, infer or hallucinate or something that he has, in, that he in fact has a right side. Um, but as far as I know, there is no vision system that can exist. I've, I've looked and I haven't found one that can infer that he is the, we don't see his right side because it is behind the barrier. Okay, so the takeaway, I'm almost done in any case, so that worked out well. Uh, the takeaways for space are, first of all, that it is an important question, often in applications of various kinds. Um, and, um, and for the working knowledge engineer, I would say this, uh, when precise information is available and pertinent, which is often the case if you have geographic information and sometimes the case in other kinds of applications, uh, then there is a range of options as to how you want to do a representation and what kind of information you actually want to record and what kind of inferences you want to support. So you want to consider this with some care, what your options are. Um, when incomplete information is critical, you are likely to be in a bad state. Um, so one thing is, just, so, so, so best I can advise at the moment is, um, first of all, do not sort of automatically recast them in terms of complete information. You may end up wanting to do that. You want to you want to think if naturally the information presents itself in terms of incomplete information, you want to begin by thinking about that and how you can best cope with that. And second of all, if interesting cases come up, please let me personally know about it because uh, it's a subject that I follow uh, quite closely, I try to follow closely, and I'm interested in hearing about it. So that, with that, I will uh, finish and thank you for. Um, coming, uh, and we can turn to discussion. Uh, there's a lot of work. Gary has his hand up. Okay. Uh, hello, uh, Ernie. Thank you for this uh, interesting uh, conversation and presentation. I had a question on features. It's, it's a little bit in the chat. You mentioned features in passing. A number of us uh, in the uh, Earth Science Information Partner area are struggling with some of that, considering things like sweet ontologies and, and bow ontologies. Mm -hmm. And so there's a range of ideas about features, from geo features to spatial features to geological features. I'm just wondering whether as part of any of your, your work, you've thought a little bit about how to handle that. Some people will uh, uh, have features that are sort of small scale, relatively small scale. On the, on the other hand, from some perspective, an Earth uh, the Earth itself might be considered a feature, a planetary feature. So, any any thoughts about that? Um, no, I mean my, my own uh, uh, my own work is focused on on you know physical reasoning at this mostly at the scale of of uh, of household objects at the scale that uh, the you know a, a domestic robot would have to uh, deal with. Um, and, uh, you know, the feature space is, 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 is very large and, uh, and, and, you know, quite specific to the application. Um, and, you know, coming up with a general, 
spatial feature language seems to be seems to be very hard. So that you know, that's not a very useful answer, but that's the best I can do. Any other comment? Terry is next. Terry. You're unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, the, the question he was asking about un, 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 par, uh, missing information in, in his last chart. Uh, Ernie, the, 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 the thing that struck me immediately was that, that in the coffee cup example, you, you don't know where the, where the uh, gravitational vector is or if there even is one. Uh, so that yeah, uh, you, you can turn a coffee cup upside down on the space station. Uh, and well, strange the, things must happen to the coffee when you do that. I wouldn't. Well, well no, it doesn't. <laughs> I wouldn't that's trust that it point. stays in the cup. No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, that's that's the whole point. Uh, mm. That that the, that without the without the gravitational without the without gravity, uh, your example is incomplete. That's true. Thank yeah, you. no, I'm talking. No, 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 no. My 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 example is relative to uh, relative to the conventional. Um, well, but who's convention? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> okay. I think fair to say that most AI applications are taking place in a gravitational field. Anyway, but point taken. Yes. I mean, if you're if you're doing if you're doing if you're doing astronomical reasoning, which is a a, a subject I sometimes like to think about, though I haven't done anything with it. Uh, then of course, first of all, the scale issues become, <laughs> become astronomical, uh, and uh, you know, all, 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 all your terrestrial assumptions go out the window. But things are nice and tend to be nice and spherical, other than galaxies. That uh, does have that advantage. Okay, we've got Robbie and then Janet. Who wants to go first? I would say Janet. Okay. Um, yes, hi, thanks. Very good uh, talk. And it's always good to hear um, mature voices on this um, because as you know, um, people can get enthusiastic and not be cautioned by all of the things that can, um, the thicket of issues that come up. Um, the, so I was glancing at your book uh, uh, description and the causality time and space seem like they are really not um, addressable apart from each other. And you didn't have time to get into causality here, but um, causality seems to be the one that is missing from um, current enthusiasm about correlation-based AI. Mm -hmm. Could you say something on that briefly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I left the discussion of causality up to, up to Gary in writing the book, to tell you the truth, largely up to Gary in writing the book. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a subject where I feel much less, uh, secure, uh, than, than, than time or space. Um, but, uh, sure, I mean, it, 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 it a temporal rep a temporal reasoning exists in large measure to support uh, causal reasoning. Um, you know, causal reasoning, um, you know, can be extract, can be abstracted in, uh, can be abstracted in an atemporal way, but almost always has a temporal component. In fact, if one looks deeper, and I think it's generally a mistake to try to cut out the temporal uh, component. Um, right, uh, so I guess, I guess that's what I was saying, is that the three of them really, um, on causality, space, and time, are um, really intertwined. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah, and, and um, just in, in Gary's piece in the Times about your book there, um, the, we've had people talk about um, uh, you know, the, the deep, deep learning, but it's all correlational. And um, 
and without a causal component, um, one is, uh, you know, lacking the way that the way the three of them are are interlocked. Anyway, oh, yeah. so as sure usual, nice. a, a comment rather than a question. But thanks, very good uh, material. Thanks. 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 Yeah, I mean, the, the the deep learning people are are are, are you know, very much aware of that, and they are, you know, the, the, uh, common sense reasoning has become something of a buzzword uh, in the uh, in the um, learning world. And I'm losing you, we're losing you. Can't can't hear you, Ernie. Common sense reasoning has become something of a buzzword there, and people are, 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 are seriously looking at how one extracts causal information. But it, it, it's certainly right to say that, you know, as far as I can tell, um, the current technology is an awful lot better at finding correlations than at finding, uh, at, at, at extracting causality. Okay. So, are you, anything else, Ravi? Yeah, well, uh, there is a prior priority is given to Mike Gruninger if he is re ready to ask any question. People are saying, why don't you um, moderate, I mean, make comments on the discussion. So I yield to Mike first. If Michael doesn't, then I will ask my question. Um, oh, sorry, Ravi. Uh, Ernie, that was a was a great talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, yeah, a great coverage of all the issues. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, 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 no significant comments right now. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, there was a question. I, I just wanted. Oh, go ahead, Ravi. Yeah, uh, my comments were that when we are talking of closed systems. Things like engineering, uh, manufacture, design, uh, sequence of processes in a business process, etc. We are able to define both space and time reasonably well and manipulate them. Also, similarly, in repetitive satellite image data processing systems or Internet of Things, where formats, place, ID number of the station, etc., are well known. These are easy to tackle. But uh, problem comes when you are conversing about something with plain English uh, or any other language. Then you are challenged by meaning of both time and space in that context. I'm probably saying the same thing with Janet so nicely said in terms of cause, causal relationships, but I'm not understanding that part fully yet. So Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. The, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, um, open systems uh, are an awfully lot, uh, awful lot harder than closed systems. Uh, even in closed systems, particularly on the spatial side, um the uh the problems can get difficult um if it, 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 you know if you the problem with a closed system is um you know you can start with perfect information but you know as noise builds up you start to lose information and you are back into an imperfectly known situation Yes, but then we can we have means to calibrate in that case, recalibrate, like a sensor drift or something of that sort. Yeah, yeah. If there's, if so you're, 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 in literature, open conversation, non-engineering systems, the difficulties are quite monumental. Sure. But even in places like geology or geospatial, lot of progress has been made by agencies like NASA. Uh, oh, for sure. for sure. And manufacturing. But when are we going to reach knowledge graphs that address at least the closed systems and then later maybe the open system? Well, 
uh, I think there's a lot more, certainly on the temporal side and on both sides that, that could be done in knowledge graphs. Uh, with current technology and without addressing AI complete problems. Um, the, uh, the, um, and I think, I, I think should, be, I think should be, I take it that, you know, the, the reason they haven't been is that they haven't seemed um, as pressing or as valuable as, as, as some other issues. But I, you know, I, I, I think, th I, I think there's a great deal more that could be done without enormous conceptual advances. Okay. Um, Thank you. We're, we're running out of time. We actually passed the hour, but um, Gary has his hand up and Josh has a question about frames of reference. Where do you see frames of reference coming into the representations you have discussed? <laughs> the, the absolute first paper I ever wrote in AI had to do with frames of reference uh, and partial knowledge of frames of reference. Um, it's uh, um, uh, you know, you, 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 do, you, you, you do want to establish a variety of frames of reference, of reference uh, and that, you know, that very much increases your uh, expressive power, um, particularly in, in, in situations where, you know, some of the spatial relations are well known, some of them are, 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 are poorly known. Uh, I haven't, I've seen very little work on that uh, in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, it's, it's, and I don't know of, uh, I don't know of much work on it. I haven't seen much work of it, on it on, on the vision side or the robotic side either. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, again, a techno, you know, a, a problem. It has its technical difficulties, uh, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's a problem where it might well be possible to do a lot more than is currently being done. Okay, Gary? Yes, uh, I have a, another sort of open question that might relate a little bit to frames of reference. It goes back to some of the, the comments you made, I think back in the 80s about Pat Hayes's naive physics, and after that we had micro theories. These are both topics that have been uh, discussed from time to time here in the forum. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you have anything up to, up to, new to say about it, up to date to bring us, uh, from your perspective, uh, the relevance of things like micro theories uh, for common sense uh, reasoning and, and uh, knowledge. Um. Uh, okay, uh, so micro theories is, as far as I know, a term from the psych world. Uh, is it, you know, turn it, uh, Doug Lennett coined, um, and, and psych uses micro theories very extensively that I know. Uh, I have, I have tried very unsuccessfully to get a clear idea of what is going on in psych and, and one of the things I do not have a clear idea about, one of the many things I do not have a clear idea, idea about relative to psych is, is uh, exactly how the micro theories, exactly what leverage they're getting out of the micro theories. Uh, I don't know of any other system that has used that kind of structure extensively. Um, so, uh, you know, ultimately, ultimately, I think you do want to, I mean, you know, there, there, there was a lot of, there was a lot of work in the 70s and 80s on, on, on so-called contexts, which was the same thing, more or less. Um, but uh, that's, you know, um, that's not widely used as far as I know. Uh, so, 
and, and you know, most, most knowledge maps, as far as I know, are completely flat in terms of the micro theory structure. Uh, there's one overall theory. Um, so, so I'm not sure. I've never been entirely sold on the idea. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the, cer certainly there are, you, you, you need to bring to bear different kinds of information in different kinds of situations, but whether that organ, whether that, that constraint organizes itself elegantly into well-defined micro theories is a lot less clear to me. Thank you. It's at least nice to know your opinion on this. <laughs> Thanks. That was really very enlightening. So I, I believe we should now adjourn. Okay, well, thanks very much again. Um, thank you. It's really very, very useful, very enlightening. And um,